I am a PhD student in Germany working on this beautiful spider species, the European wasp spider. And um, it's, as I said, part of my PhD. This is a Palearctic species that has undergone a really rapid um, range expansion in the last 100 years in Europe. Um, it exists outside of Europe, as I said, Palearctic, but within Europe, that's where we see this rapid range expansion. The topic of my PhD thesis is um, understanding the role of local adaptation, phenotypic plasticity, and admixture in this range expansion and in the colonization of new habitats in the species. Um, obviously, I think from this question, you can tell that having a well-resolved genome would be really useful um, in understanding the genetic underpinnings of these different traits. In other projects that other people are working on, um, as well as projects that I'm working on, um, our guy, Pibrinahi, is of interest in the field of sexual selection um, and evolution, um, chemical communication, the microbiome, which is a talk that I gave a few weeks ago in this uh, series, and also um, there's a group working on venom in this species. Now, um, to give a little bit of an introduction, and a lot of this um, Darko already talked about, in previous studies on spider genomes, there was a focus on whole genome duplication, um, silk evolution, venom evolution, and in a recent publication, whole genome methylation. Um, and as Darko already said, and some similarities with the challenges in beetle genomes from Matt, um, spiders do have relatively large genome sizes. The species that I work with has a genome size of 1.7 gigabases, so it's um, larger than the tetragnatha genome. Spider genomes, this is all repetitive now. They're highly repetitive, lots of AT. They also have really long genes, which are hard to assemble with um, short fragments. Um, and those genes can contain repetitive elements as well. For instance, this is an Argaipi um, major ampullate silk protein sequence. Um, and just don't look closely, obviously, but you can see there's long stretches of repetitive um, sequences in there. And as Darko mentioned, a lot of spiders are you have issues with high heterozygosity. So how, knowing these challenges and hearing from Darko, I had the advantage of starting this project um, later than Darko and, and also hearing from him uh, his challenges. So I definitely had an advantage in that respect. Um, how do we overcome those problems? Um, with the large genome size, I see a solution as high sequencing coverage. And to overcome these issues with repetitive content, AT content, long genes, also heterozygosity, um, long read sequencing platforms um, are going to be sort of the future uh, as a baseline for assembly. And uh, Matt's talk gave a really good example of that with that PacBio um, assembly. And I should say in Argaipi Bernanke, in my study, we used um, a natural population or individuals from a natural population uh, that was known for high levels of inbreeding in the wild from a previous study. So, we started out um, with PacBio reads as our baseline for the assembly. We shot for um, 70x coverage of PacBio, so we did the brute force approach <laughs> that Darko mentioned of throwing a lot of long reads at a problem. Um, in reality, even though we sequel, uh, sequenced on 10 SQL cells, um, we only got 20x coverage, but it turned out to be enough. And we assembled that with the assembler WTDBG2. Uh, then we polished with 30x coverage of Illumina reads um, from a previously published study. And then that's where we ended up here with this um, these assembly st statistics. So the N50 was already pretty good within the context of um, other spider genomes with 288 kilobases. L50 um, was obviously not chromosome level. This species um, has a haplogenome size of 13 chromosomes. So to take this the next step, we added high c data, um, 440 million paired end reads, and scaffolded with the dovetails tool high rise. And this ended up really working out for us. So um, originally, dovetail actually suggested that we wouldn't be able to use high rise because our, despite it being 288 kilobases, they said that our baseline assembly was um, still too small, too fragmented. Um, but we insisted and uh, went ahead with it anyways. Um, so we ended up with an N50 of more than 120 megabases, and a, the best number here for me is the L90 of 12. So 90% of our genome within 12 scaffolds, we have um, chromosome number of 13. So 
you can see that here with the context map, we have our genome falling nicely within 13 chromosomes. And um, on the, in figure B, this uh, 90, almost 99% of our genome is contained within just 13 scaffolds. So we were honestly, after knowing Darko's experience and um, Jose's, who you'll hear from next, uh, this was surprising to us, um, but really, obviously, we were excited and, and pleased. Um, then the annotation. Um, I will admit that the annotation was done by a master's student, so if you have specific questions about that, um, I will do my best, but it's not my um, specific expertise. Um, we did repeat masking with repeat modeler and masker, and um, maybe one of the reasons that it worked out so well with the Brunicke genome is that we only have around 35% of the genome repetitive, it's still a lot, um, and it's within the other spiders, of the range of other spiders, but it's not up there with Stegodiphus and some of the others, which have 50 to 60% um, repetitive content. Most of these were still unclassified repeats, um, which is very typical for spiders. The repeat elements are not well studied. Um, to continue with the annotation, we mapped um, raw transcriptome reads to the genome using HiSat2. We used Augustus for gene prediction and InterpoScan for functional annotation. And we ended up with 23,720 protein coding genes. Again, right within the normal ballpark of um, other spiders, and 81% of them were functionally annotated. To finish up the talk, I want to place this now um, in a larger context. Like I said, previous studies have focused on whole genome duplication, silk venom, and methylation. I'm not going to talk about methylation because I haven't done anything on that myself. Um, but for whole genome duplication, the Parasteotoda genome was published um, in the context of whole genome duplication. They found a whole genome duplication event that was ancestral to spiders and scorpions. And as evidence, they had two clusters of Hox genes in their assembly. In the Archaeopi Bernicke assembly, we also have two clusters, um, cluster A and cluster B. This is the same terminology that they used in the steatoda genome. And cluster A is really nice. It's um, the Hox genes are in order, they're complete, um, not overlapping. This is just by blasting Hox genes against my assembly. Um, cluster B, however, is pretty funky. So there are some misorderings. There are genes which seem to overlap. One may not exist. It may have been consumed by the other one somehow. Um, so there are problems here. And um, what happened with the Parasteotoda genome, their cluster B was split onto two scaffolds, and they, their things were out of order as well, which they attributed to low coverage of this cluster. However, in our genome, the two clusters have pretty um, almost identical sequencing coverage um, when I map the PAC bio reads back onto them. So I feel pretty confident that this cluster B is out of order in reality. Um, and this may mean that um, following the whole genome duplication event, it has lost or changed function. Um, there's also silk and venom genes are a big um, issue and of area of interest in spiders, um, in spider genomics. These scaffold numbers will change once I've submitted everything to NCBI, um, just haven't gone through renumbering them. Um, so I just wanted to see, this is now the first chromosome level genome for a spider. Um, so I wanted to see where these different gene families map onto the chromosomes and see if there are any suggestions of interesting stories. So I'll talk about two suggestive. Again, this is very preliminary since it's one genome. Um, there will be a lot more power for interesting stories to be told once there are more chromosome level genomes in spiders. Um, so firstly, if you look at the major ampullate silk genes in spiders, um, I have lots of hits for major ampullate silk genes within one small region of one scaffold. Um, so this suggests to me that the major ampullate Silk genes probably evolved via tandem duplication, one after the other in the genome. And then this one is a little bit a harder story to tell, um, which has to do with the inter-potential co-evolutionary co history of venom and one type of silk gene. Um, so this venom genes are really poorly characterized within the family of our guy, Peter Nicky, the Aranaids. Um, so I can't say anything about the type of venom genes here, but I do have several clusters of venom genes, which flank one type of silk gene, the flagelliform silk gene. And this sort of rang a bell for me when I saw it, because in the Trichonephila clavipes genome, published a few years ago, you can see, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I hope you can, 
um, these two genes here in this, uh, in this tree, they found a flagelliform-like silk gene in the venom glands. I don't know what to make of this, but um, also in the stegodiphus genome, they found some silk-like genes expressed in the venom glands. So there seems to be some interplay of flagelliform silk and venom genes or venom glands. Um, again, it's just sort of, I was looking into what I could find within these chromosomes. Uh, with that, I'm already at the end. Um, I have, there's lots of future uses for this genome. Specifically within um, the course of my thesis, I've done DDRAD. Um, this is similar to Darko's story. If I had known when I started my PhD that I would have a chromosome level genome, um, I wouldn't have done probably DDRAD, but uh, I didn't know that, so I needed to jump right in. I sequenced the genome, I did the DDRAD. Um, but the chromosome level genome will make my inference with DDRAD data a lot stronger. So looking into signatures of selection and adaptation within the genome um, across geographic space, et cetera. Um, here at my university in Greifswald, there will be more studies on chemoreception and chemo, um, chemo sensation and the genetic underpinnings of that. We've already shared the genome with a couple of people, um, this group in Giesen studying venom in the species, as well as Jose, uh, postdoc at Berkeley, who's doing some comparative spider genomics. He's got the assembly and annotation as well. And just to tie back into my talk from two weeks ago, um, within sequencing and assembling the spider genome, we also sequenced and partially assembled the entire endosymbiont genome um, of the novel endosymbiont of the species. Uh, with that, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, without whom I would not have been able to do any part of this project, um, and also the Cal Academy for computing infrastructure, because um, I needed a lot of power to do most of these calculations. Okay, with that, um, I'll stop sharing and I'm happy to have any questions. Thanks, Monica. Okay, Darko already has a question. Hi, Monica. N nice talk and excellent genome. Congrats. Thanks. So two questions. The, the spiders that you use, why the population is naturally inbred? And for your sequencing, the different sequencing techniques that you apply, did you use the same organisms or different ones because of the inbreeding right. in the population? Right, I should have um, mentioned that. So um, first question, we knew, uh, why are they inbred? That was, um, that was part of Henrik's PhD thesis where he found high levels, um, low, heter low heterozygosity, suggestive of high inbreeding in that wild population. Um, from my own experience, to explain it, I forget what explanations may have been given in that paper precisely, but from my own experience, the populations in Portugal are extremely disconnected and the habitat there may have been more hospitable to them previously, but now the populations are really um, sparse. The spiders are hard to find. It's really dry, and I don't feel that there's a high level of connectivity between. So that's, um, I had him from this species, and so I went back to that same site. And to answer the second part of the question, these were different individuals. Um, so the pack bio, uh, that was the most specimen collected in 2013 by Henrik Kramenkel. Um, and and the, and the Illumina data was from the very, I think there were some more questions in the chat. Um, can I elaborate more on why I would not have used DDRAD? I love DDRAD. Um, it was a good thing for me to do. Um, but with a, I would probably, going forward, have done uh, more low coverage full genome resequencing rather than DDRAD to, uh, as, a, as a better approach now that I have a really good genome. OK, thank you, Monica. OK, moving on, our next speaker is Dr. Jose Serka. He is a postdoc at um, Berkeley. He's coming in from Norway. Take over. Yay. Um, thank you, Athena. And thank you, everyone, so far. Um, for those of you who are here and for those of you who are presenting, has been really cool. 
And um, so when I contacted Athena, I told her I didn't have a chromosome level assembly, but I was interested in doing a talk on um, more the comparative side of genomics. So I'm very happy to talk after Darko and Monica after, um, after they explained a lot that I don't have time to. And so I joined Rosemary Gillespie's lab last year and Rosie had the genome lying around. And I started poking with it and started trying to find signatures here and there and understanding what was on, going on. And I started finding signatures of food metabolism, sensory perception evolution. And so um, I'm not an expert in the field. So if you have any criticism, if you have anything, I'm excited with the results, but I'm a bit wary and I'm trying to, um, to make something out of all of this. So bear with me for the next 10 minutes. So um, stepping back to spiders, I recently started reading a Spider 101 book. Um, I did my PhD in worms. And there were two particular aspects of spider biology that really caught my attention. And the first one is the fact that they are just able to disperse around the globe. So for example, if you know ballooning, they just um, have a thread of silk and with the wind off they go. And they're able to colonize remote islands such as Hawaii um, and as an evolutionary biologist, I look at this as they just come to a new community, completely new biotic interactions, completely new abiotic interactions. And the second fact that we know about spiders is that they really have this um, exciting um, behavior, set of behaviors, traits, characteristics. So um, there are really cool examples of camouflaging, of mimicking, um, they just are able to have silks and webs and they have, they are one of the most important predators. And so, um, when I put these facts together and when I start thinking, start thinking about this, I was thinking, okay, um, if you come to a new environment, um, you'll have to eat the food that's there. And so I was asking myself, is there any genomic basis for, um, these spiders to being a predator? And so, um, if I put myself in a skin of a spider to answer this question, I think I would have to have a really good, um, a really good set of chemosensory, knowing what's around in the environment, having to um, move fast, have a lot of sensory perception, but also have some, a lot a repertoire of venoms to paralyze different prey, and also um, feeding metabolism um, genes because I'm going to eat a lot of new things, right? So. The story begins with Tetragnata kawaiensis from Hawaii and, um, and with Ellie Armstrong, who was in Rosemary Gillespie's lab a few years back, and she sequenced the genome of Tetragnata kawaiensis. Kelly, you might know her, she's now at Stanford working with big cats. And so she did an Illumina sequencing and high C contiguity ligation genome, and she got really good um, results until Monica's genome came along. It was the best spider genome that um, I knew. So we have 4,000 scaffolds. Um, the genome size is one gig. And we have a, a, a scaffold that's 10 megabases. And so when I started analyzing the patterns of um, chemosensory, um, I, I noticed that in families in spiders, there have been these um, chemosensory families that have been recently identified only last year or two years ago. And so I started the collaboration and working with this program called Bitakura that gets the, the protein profiles from these families. So basically you just look for um, those particular amino acids or those particular sequence of amino acids that um, make a gustatory receptor, a gustatory receptor and um, so forth. And what we found out is that across several spiders and the topmost one is a scorpion, and the rest of those are spiders, we find um, a lot of variation in terms of various chemosensory families. So only to show you the results of two of those, but the last one, Arneus ventricosus, has 1,436 GRs, um, whereas Lactrovectus hesperus in the, in the middle has 84. And this variation is also present at other families. So for example, um, you will see that there's a, a spider with 59 IRs, 443 IRs. So there seems to be a lot of variation um, across the genomes. 
And um, with venoms, we have the same um, type of result, which is super cool. Which is, and in here, what I did was I just blasted the spider toxin database on several genomes. And this analysis is still ongoing because I'm trying to classify them. But again, we find this variation um, associated with in different genomes, with, for example, some of these having 900, um, 900 of these venoms, whereas other spe species have 146. I think that some of these species have really low numbers, like Lactrovictus here, because there's a substantial part of the genome missing. But I will not attribute all the variation that we're seeing in the data set um, to just some kind of missing buscos, although some of these genomes can be pretty bad, as Dark showed. Um, and so going now to what Monica said, um, we now know that there has been a whole genome duplication in the lineage before, uh, in the lineage ancestrals to modern scorpions and spiders. And I was trying to see whether, as people have been looking in spiders on Hox genes, whether there has been another whole genome duplication somewhere, somewhere in a lineage of spiders. And what I'm finding is that there's likely no whole genome duplication as Monica was showing. Um, and because everything has like one or two Hox genes, there's some variation um, because getting the whole cluster is actually hard. Um, but then the genome size, as you see, they vary between four gigs, 2.4 gigs, um, one gig. And as Dark showed, there's a tarantula with six gigs. So um, it seems to me, I don't have direct evidence to say this, but the hypothesis would be that these genomes have a lot of repeat content, a lot of um, evolution is going on, but it's not attributed to whole genome duplication. But for example, things like an, um, an even crossing over, an equal crossing over, and creation of um, tandemly arrayed chemosensory genes, venom genes with posterior neo-functionalization. Um, so saving the best for the last, what I did was a computational analysis of gene family evolution. And so this method works by um, assigning clusters of genes that are very similar to each other. So let's say cluster one represents a bunch of genes that are very closely related. Cluster two is another cluster of genes that are closely related. So um, in, a, in a model similar to gene family evolution, where the genes are very um, similar. And putting this on the arachnid tree of life, or the arachnid genomes that I have available, and that had um, a Contig N50, a decent Contig N50, and that I could do some of the statistics. So below branches, you have bootstrap supports, 100 for all of them. Um, above branches in blue, you have the number of significantly expanded gene families, the clusters I was talking about. And then in brackets, we just have a branch ID. And as I started, I got these families and I was like, okay, these numbers mean nothing, but I was actually able to, um, to label these with co-orthology and with the biological function. And there we did get some really cool results, which um, yeah, I guess I'm happy with that. For example, in the scorpion, we do find that some of these gene families are associated with DNA integration, transmembrane transport, but also carbohydrate metabolism. So, um, and as we walk through other arachnids, this is a signature that's found in spiders. You have some evil devo type of families that are um, significantly expanded, but then in this area, you do have sodium ion transport, so movement, metabolism of manos. Um, in Lactrovectus, you have ketin metabolism, sodium ion transport again. In Pars Ditoda, you have um, metabolism, branch three, which is the branch connecting tetragnata, um, Araneos, and Nephila, or holding that clay together, um, has, has signatures of metabolism and sensory perception of taste. Tetragnata, again, with perception of taste, sodium ion transport, carbohydrate and ketin metabolism, sorry for um, the letter size. The font size, um, branch one, having lipid catabolism, regulation of carbohydrate metabolism, lipoprotein metabolism, um, sensory perception of taste again, and um, Nephila having digestion, ketin metabolism. Um, I'm saying the word metabolism a lot, sorry. <laughs> and then Aranos um, 
having again ketone metabolism, uh, sensory perception of taste, manose metabolism, and um, that's it. So um, going back to the to the question that I posed to in the, that I posed in the beginning of the talk. Um, if there's a genomic basis for spiders being predators, well, um, we do find wide variation in chemo receptors. In uh, we find wide variation in venoms, um, possibly because they have all this variation in terms of repeated content, as um, as we saw in the previous two talks. Um, and then they do seem to have the genomes enriched for genes which have feeding metabolism, sensory perception type of function. So yeah, just the acknowledgements, everyone for hearing me, Athena for organizing, Ellie for um, getting the genome and doing a stellar work, Rosemary for all her support and um, enthusiasm, and Mark, Rose, and Joel for um, support and for infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, any questions? Darko. Hey, just a nice work with all the comparisons. It's hard to do that when there, there's not so many genomes available. So great. <laughs> so one question: Would you, what would be your prediction in terms of chemosensory genes if you compare the spiders that spin webs, like big clays, clays, and the ones that are ambush predators? Do you think that the ones that are active predators will have less chemosensory? genes because they are they can actually see the spiders to be praise in many cases or, or yeah what, what is just what is your prediction well um that's an excellent question i don't have any prediction for that i haven't put much thought because these results are quite new but what i have been thinking is that um until the degree that we can actually predict when some changes occurred because if you notice um, the external branches in the phylogeny that I showed, they do have a lot of significant expansions, but given that they are not on internal branches, that means that they might have been only recent, right? So um, uh, we would have to do a more systematic work with more genomes, um, try to determine like at different clades and better. But um, I'm sure, as you know, some of these spider genomes have 60% of Busco's missing. Um, I found the spider genome with 10 times more genes, and that was excluded from the analysis than any other spider genome. So it had more data that genome per, per self than the rest. But yeah, so sorry, I don't have a, an answer for that. But um, maybe comparing at different phylogenetic scales, like closely related species like or tetragnatus, and then yeah, at yeah. other levels would be. Thanks. Um, I saw a question on the chat. Jose, can you elaborate on the cafe analysis? Is it looking for gene family expansion? Yeah, so um, basically what cafe do is doing is you just first make these clusters and then you give it the phylogeny and given the phylogeny, it just tries to look for inside the, that cluster with all the genes. If Tetragnata has 100 of those genes and everything else has only one, then it will say, like, look, there's a gene family expansion of, um, of this cluster. And then what I did was just um, annotating these gene clusters using Google orthology and using other things. And now I'm just making some really big um, Excel sheets and stuff. If you're interested, I can always send my code and just how I organized things. I'm um, happy to, to share my, my resources. All right, thank you, Jose. Okay, our last speaker of the day is Nicholas Alessandri. Nicholas is a student at Berkeley and he's going to be talking about hummingbirds. Nick, All right, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I pressed present now, I assume. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's see, we'll do, okay, great. And then can everyone see this? Not yet. Okay, we're getting there. Yep, see it. Okay, great. Um, so uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about two different systems um, that I'm working on. Uh, the first one is the broad-tailed hummingbird. 
Uh, this is a system that I've been setting up as a non-model organism for studying population genetics since 2015. Um, since then, I've been measuring, uh, capturing birds, measuring various traits in the population, um, and have resequenced the genomes of uh, over 500 individuals. And so in order to do this resequencing experiment, we needed to have a high quality reference assembly um, to, to map these various uh, genomes to so that we can perform a genome wide association study on these various traits. Um, so the first assembler that I, I used was uh, the canoe assembler. Um, we used about 15 cells on the PacBio SQL 2. Uh, sorry, the text is in the, in the purple up there. Um, but you can see that our original N50 was roughly uh, 550 megabases. Um, so we did a series of polishing steps um, after we got HiC and Chicago libraries done um, on the same tissue. So for high C and Chicago, you need to have uh, flash frozen tissue. So um, we got uh, a bird that had hit someone's window and died. And so I guess they had put it in the freezer right away, which means the cells were still alive. The point of high C and Chicago is that you are retaining the cro chromatin structure of the, of the cells. Um, and so the problem with high C and Chicago data is that it's relatively uneven across the genome. It, it's pretty scattered. So polishing can, be, um, polishing can be a little difficult. So we did a series of steps where we first mapped uh, our, pack, our raw pack bio reads to our canoe assembly with Blazor, polished this with PB DAGCON, um, and then identified contaminants with blasts for mitochondria and various uh, viruses and bacteria. Um, and then we did a, a separate set of error correction with low REM, um, and then um, we further reduced our assembly after removing contaminated scaffolds with bed tools. Um, and so although Chicago and HiC show that there's about roughly 50x coverage genome-wide, these are really only um, locally, locally abundant reads. Um, and so we got our chromosome assembly after using the dovetail high-rise pipeline. Um, and removed about 3,000 contigs. Um, we used juice box in order to assemble our chromosomes. Um, and then our final assembly was annotated uh, using a, a few different tools. Um, so first off, we, we closed our gaps with LR gap closer, and then we mapped our reads back to the assembly with PB line to polish with Arrow. Um, Arrow uh, used to be called Quiver. This is the updated Quiver, so you're polishing with your raw pack bio reads. Um, soft mask with repeat masker, annotated with gene model mapper, um, and then we used input evidence from Anna's chicken and zebra finch. So all of this was done in collaboration with Austin Mudd in the Rockstar lab at UC Berkeley. Um, so this is something interesting that comes out of uh, bird assemblies. If you look at any of the, the highest quality bird assemblies, you get a BUSCO score at about 90%. So this suggests that in bird assemblies, about 10% of the BUSCOs are missing. And we think this is because um, of a, uh, basically it, it was outlined in a previous paper. Sorry, skipped a couple slides. Uh, is there a way to go back? There. Um, okay, so one problem with bird assemblies is that you get these intronal expansions of repeats. And these repeats actually form loops inside of the sequencer such that the polymerase does not sequence anything inside of the loop. Um, so we followed up on some of these missing, um, missing boots goes and actually used split read mapping. Split read mapping is something where you can, you can actually use your um, raw pack bio reads and map them to another bird assembly that has the gene of interest. And the pattern by which the reads are mapping um, through so something called soft clipping that I'm happy to talk more about you can actually distinguish between true deletions in your assembly versus a structural exclusion in the sequencer. So this, I imagine, is going to be more and more prevalent with bird assemblies, especially, because of this 10% this missingness. Um, so our final assembly turned out to be pretty good, where we had an N50 of about um, 72 megabases, which I was pretty happy about. Um, the great thing about this assembly is you can get good coverage of the sex chromosome. So I used the, the chicken sex chromosomes to blast to my assembly to, to find out which chromosomes in my assembly were the hummingbird sex chromosomes. 
So it turns out chromosome four was our chromosome Z. So then when you're resequencing individuals, you can simply just plot coverage on that chromosome. And when you get half the coverage, you, you can say that you have a female. And when you get the normal genome-wide coverage, you can say that it's a male. Um, however, how do, we, how do we assess the completeness of our assembly relative to other bird assemblies because of this high missingness? So you can use OrthoVen2, and this will allow you to compare your gene content with other bird assemblies. And so compared to other bird assemblies, we found that ours actually had less missingness than the turkey or the zebra finch. So for a bird assembly, we had um, most of the genes that were expected, if not more. Um, can people still hear me? Just want to check in. Yes. OK, great. Um, so this other project is a little different, and I'll tell you why this assembly was done in a different way. So this is the spike dace. This is a, an endangered fish in, in uh, Arizona and New, and New Mexico. The bottom right is a loach minnow. We're working on a genome for both. Um, <clears throat> so this population, um, this particular species, declined rapidly in the past few years due to the Wallows wildfire in 2013. So what we've been doing is a time series analysis where we sequence individuals prior to and after the wildfire in order to look for regions under selection due to environmental change. Um, so for this assembly, we use the Falcon Unzip Assembler. Um, uh, so we use the Falcon Unzip Assembler in, in, um, in tandem with some Illumina sequences for polishing. So we had about 63x coverage from PacBio and 15x from Illumina. Um, so we polished the genome with Arrow. We did one round of Arrow using our PacBio reads and polished with a couple round, two rounds of polishing with the Illumina data using Freebase. Um, and so you can see the increase in the N50 stats in each uh, chunk of the assembly. Um, so then we look at our Busco scores uh, and you get about 97% completeness. This is great. Um, however, you'll notice that duplications are at about 20%. So I wanted to confirm whether this was an artifact of the assembly or if this was due to ancient whole genome duplication events in fish. So what I did was, as a control, I looked at the salmon genome. Salmon have undergone um, two whole genome duplications since the, since the common, um, common ancestor of all fishes. And you actually see that the salmon is at about 40%. So what I did for any further polishing of this genome, I removed um, the haplotigs from this assembly. The Falcon Unzip Assembler splits your, your genome into primary contigs and haplotigs. So we removed all our duplicated haplotigs from this assembly to incorporate OmniC. Um, OmniC is wonderful because it's essentially high C that is uniform. It's, it's high C data that you get uniformly across the genome. So um, we got about 81x coverage using OmniC, which, which was uniformly distributed. Um, the great thing about it being uniformly distributed is it requires less quality control and you can use it to polish. So the reason people don't use high C data to polish is because of how uneven it's, unevenly it's distributed. So we, um, we've been using OmniC to polish our data set and assemble chromosomal scaffolds using the Salsa um, software. Um, and so the follow-up steps I'm currently working on right now are um, we've used a program called DGenies where first off, you take your scaffolds that are output by Salsa and you map them against the closest chromosomal level assembly. So for this, I use zebrafish. Um, and so this type of plot here will allow you to orient yourself when you're using Juicebox. Um, so that way you can actually say, well, these, these uh, contigs are likely to be in a chromosome given the information we see in the Digenes plot and in the contact mapping um, heat map on the right. Uh, so that is what I have. Um, did anybody have any questions? I know that was kind of a lot of information really fast.